Good morning. Yeah, that works. So who is excited about the future? Who wants to learn something? Good, that's what we're here for. So this session is about GraphQL, React, Redux, Apollo, and our beloved Drupal. So to shortly introduce us, my name is Michael, or people call me Schnitzel. Um, I'm the CTO of Amita Labs. And with me, we have Brandon, one of our developers from Amazing Labs Austin. Amazing Labs does a lot of different things. Uh, one of them is Drupal, and recently we also do quite some React. But actually, if we look a bit at the past, um, between 2013, when the whole idea of decoupled came up, we were actually a big, big opponent of it. Why? There were a lot of different reasons, and our lead developer in Zurich, Sebastian, or also called Fubi, he actually wrote a blog post, which you can see, which is not good. Let's fix that. Can you see it now? No? Yes, okay. So he wrote a blog post about Headless Drupal, the cake is a lie. And so how it comes, we never really implemented um, any decoupled sites because we saw a lot of issues. If you wanna read his blog post, search for um, Headless Drupal, the cake is a lie. Basically it's about accessibility, performance, overhead that decoupled websites create. So in October 2016, we had a client um, in the Maze Lab Zurich team that asked us, we would like to build 12 websites that look completely different from the front end, but they wanna use all the same back end. Plus, there are gonna be most probably 12 different teams that implement the different front ends, but again, they still wanna use the same Drupal back end. So initially you think about, okay, um, well, hmm. And then you maybe go into a phase of like, what, like why, and like what the hell, how could we even do that? And yeah, then we started thinking, like it has to be possible, but we really thought like we don't just wanna create 12 different themes for the same Drupal site, because if you looked at the sites, they were so vastly different, and some of them worked completely different. So we had an idea. We had an idea to actually go back to the thing that we didn't like, the decoupled, let's look at that again. Let's look what happened over the last three years. And we did that. And this morning, <laughs> really this morning, I got up at six o'clock in the morning, we launched our first um, fully decoupled React website with um, GraphQL, Apollo, and Redux that talks to a Drupal 8 um, backend. So what does it do? So we have a Drupal on the backend. We have a React, Apollo, and Redux frontend. What all of them do, we will go a bit deeper into. And in between, we have a GraphQL API that allows the frontend, React, Apollo, Redux, talk to the backend in Drupal 8. So how do we feel today? Actually pretty happy. It is Right now, for us, the most exciting thing that's happening because we feel it is finally possible to do decoupled websites in a good way. And I'm gonna show you, together with Brandon today, how we do that, what are the different components, how do they work, and yes, there are gonna be quite some demos involved, and we really hope that the demo god is nice to us today, that it works. So the presentation is gonna be about GraphQL, what is it? GraphQL in Drupal. Then we're gonna talk about React as a front end. And then we wanna see all together working. And we're gonna do that. But let's first go into GraphQL. What is GraphQL even? So GraphQL has been introduced by Facebook. And they are actually using it in all your mobile apps. They're running with GraphQL since 2012. And they publicly, um, published the schema, the idea, the, the specification behind it in 2015, and since then, it has been very fastly used by a lot of different people. So, 
Let's look at that. Who of you has seen the Star Wars API? Okay, so if you look at the Star Wars API, um, you have an endpoint like here. We have people one and we get back, we get Luke Skywalker and we get whatever, uh, the colors and we get the films. But then we realize, hmm, like now if I wanna see the films, I have to do another request. And maybe in there, there are all the directors and I wanna have the birth date of the directors. So let's say I wanna show something which shows all the people plus their films. With regular REST, what that is, we will end up in running a lot of different requests. Or I could go to the person that actually implemented me that back or that API endpoint and ask him, can you instead of like showing the URL or the, the next endpoint, can you just please um, inject also the director's name? But then maybe Brandon wants to do something different and so you end up in a lot of different APIs. So GraphQL fixes that. GraphQL comes per default with a really nice UI that is called GraphQL. And the idea is not only that you can write your queries in there, you can actually learn how your API works. There is no documentation that you have to read in order to understand how to query it. So how does it work? On the left side, I'm writing my query. On the right side, I have the output. And you're gonna be a big fan of control space and comment space, because if I press control space, it shows me all the different fields I can request. So I can say, well, I wanna have a person, and I wanna define the person, so I just open um, a bracket and say, okay, person ID is one. And I press comment enter, and it gives me already an ID back. Well, that ID is maybe not the cool stuff, so I'm saying, hmm, what can I get of that person? So it now shows me all the fields inside that person. And I can say name, and I press enter, and I have to go Luke Skywalker. Not very fancy so far. Everything we can do via REST API. But now, let's look at that. So in there, I'm not only having fields, but I'm also having relationships to other objects. There is a film connection relationship. So, I can add film collect and add. And now it auto completes me, like you have to add some edges and some nodes, but GraphQL does it automatically. And I can see now, if I control space here, now it shows me everything that is possible out for films. And I can show the title, or I can say, show me the director. And now in here, on the right side, I have the person, Luke Skywalker, with their films, when they, the title and the director. So the idea behind GraphQL is that you're not just consuming API endpoints, you're actually telling the API what you want and how it should be outputted. If for example, my, um, my app um, expects the director to be, let's say, um, um, something else, I can just add another name for that and now I'm getting back blah instead of the director. So I can define to the endpoint what I really want. And the best is it, I can do multiple queries at the same time. So right now I'm requesting the person and I'm pressing the films in there. But I can just go down here and I can do another one. And I can say, mm, by the way, and I would like to have all species as well. So and of these species, please show me the language they're talking. So on top, I still have my request, but at the bottom, at the same time, with one single API request, I'm also getting all the species with all their languages. So basically the idea is you give the power to the person that actually needs the data. You're just exposing an API and the person that uses it can define what they need, what they use, how they use it. So let's go back here. So GraphQL gives you exactly what you need. You can run multiple resources at once. You can query multiple things at once. The gra it, and what I showed you, it actually goes much further. You have fragments, you can inject variables that you can reuse, there's a lot of other things. And the very interesting part is 
any schema is possible. So all the fields we requested now, you, the person that writes the GraphQL API can define them completely your own. You can create everything what you want there. The next interesting part is we can not only request stuff, we can also create stuff, we can change stuff. You could also have full mutation support. And the, ver the very interesting part of it as well, there is no version of a GraphQL API. Because if you're adding another field, you just add it, and the person that is gonna use it with their API can just request it. And GraphQL is based on a very strongly typed um, system. If we actually go here and click on the right side on the documentations, we can see all the different um, queries we have, and if we go into a person, we can see that's typed person, and we have different types, but we also have like the regular types, but we also have a planet type. So who can tell me a CMS that is strongly typed? Drupal, Drupal 8. The entity API is fully typed. You have very strong types, you know exactly what was is, so GraphQL makes a lot of sense to run inside Drupal, because we already do these things. We already have relationships between objects. We call them entity references. You already have objects with fields. We see them again in GraphQL. So we said, let's combine them. Let's try it, and it works. So we've built, or the community built, we were part of it, a Drupal GraphQL module that gives you full GraphQL support. And because I said I want to actually see how somebody does, I told Brandon roughly 48 hours ago or 24 hours ago, nice. <laughs> you should try it. And he did. And he will show us now what he learned over using GraphQL in the roughly last 24 hours. Thank you. So I... Well, yeah, he gave me, we have a talk to do. You need to do some things. So I've been using it for less than 24 hours. These are all the mistakes I made, AKA noob tips for you guys. If you are interested in this stuff and you want to turn around and start using GraphQL in the next hour or so, this should help you out. Uh, first of all, uh, the GraphQL module for Drupal, you should use Composer to install it. Uh, both branches require uh, external PHP libraries, so just use Composer, save yourself some trouble. <clears throat> the second thing is which version should you use? There's a 2x branch and a 3x branch. Uh, if you like all of the things that are said on the project's description page, use 2x. It includes uh, all of the default schema that will let you get all of the data out of Drupal uh, and query all that stuff, but it's the old version. So if you want to experiment with GraphQL with a Drupal site that has data already and kind of see what queries can I run to get the data I want, the 2x branch is the best for that. However, if you want to start building this for a production site or you think this is going to go live, I would suggest using the 3x branch. Uh, it's the new stuff. It's been re-architected, has a much better uh, object-oriented style, much easier to extend your own schema, and coming in May, it will have full uh, Drupal schema support, just like the 2x branch. So if you wait just, just a little bit longer, you'll have everything that 2x has, but it's a much better developer experience, much more maintainable. So uh, usage basics. Uh, this may seem obvious at first, but you should learn GraphQL first before you start using GraphQL with Drupal. Uh, if you think that you're gonna install GraphQL and that gives you everything you need to know to start writing queries, that's not exactly correct. But the syntax is simple, the concepts are simple. Just go to the graphql.org slash learn. You'll get all the basic concepts and that will give you all the necessary information you need to then start using the GraphQL uh, UI, which Michael showed you in the demo. The good news is this comes with both versions of the GraphQL module. So if you install GraphQL module in Drupal, you will get the graphical user interface. 
and with your basic understanding of queries, you can use the autocomplete that uh, the GraphQL module gives you to start autocompleting all of your Drupal stuff, and that is a much better way to learn exactly how GraphQL module in Drupal works and what schema it provides. Uh, so I have some examples. If you use the 2x branch, this is the schema that uh, the GraphQL module provides. Uh, so one example is you can run node query type searches. So on the left, I'm saying give me all nodes with the title test article, return the node ID, the status, the rendered output, and the user ID. And on the right-hand side, it gives me all that information. And that's just built in. You install the module. You go to slash graphical slash explore, and you get your data. And you can start querying that immediately. For the 3x branch, uh, it's much less out of the box friendly. The only things that are really easy to do is you can query an entity by ID, and then you can get the ID back. And that's it. <laughs> so if you want more data than that from the 3x branch, you do have to actually write some code. Um, Fortunately, like I said, it's being re-architected, much better uh, object-oriented programming style. It's actually uh, not that bad. There's a class for your schema, there's a class for your fields, and there's a class for your types. You write a little bit of glue code, you extend all the base classes from GraphQL, and all your autocomplete stuff starts working in the graphical, and everything works well. So my advice is, in the 3x branch for GraphQL module, there is a example module. It has, if you also enable that, you will get a lot more data out of your uh, Drupal database by default, but it like replaces everything. So you wouldn't want to use that example module in production. You would just use it as an example for writing your own module. There's also a module in uh, the Deep Drupal decoupled app, which Michael will demo a little bit later, uh, called GraphQL underscore demo. It also has a lot more code to kind of tell you, or give you an example of how you should write your own stuff. So for the 3x branch, uh, it's much nicer that you get this kind of base schema that the GraphQL mo module gives you, but in your custom module, you can extend the schema with anything you want. So that gives you, you can start writing your own custom GraphQL modules and stuff. Uh, so I started writing the GraphQL backend for the Texas Camp website, which is built in React. And we already had a Drupal site with uh, backend data in it. So this is the structure it kind of looks like. You first define the root query field, which here is section by name. That will return a type, which I have the section type. And on the section type, you define what fields are available. And I said, I want to return a body, an image, and a title. So it's really just three classes, a little schema glue, and you've got data being returned out of your GraphQL API. And so in just a couple hours, uh, after figuring out a few things, which hopefully you now don't have to also, uh, I had a totally functioning GraphQL app. Uh, in like 30 minutes, I plugged in the Apollo stuff with React, and I had React querying and getting data from Drupal. And it's all up and running, and I have a fully functional Drupal GraphQL and React app. It's very easy. Cool. Thank you. OK, you might wonder, like, OK, it's, it looks or it sounds like not fully done yet. Things, well, we actually use it in production. So the site that you might be already queried is running that behind. Um, and yes, we will write a default schema for it. So the idea is that when you download the GraphQL module, there is a schema in there that you can enable. It's going to be opinionated by us. So based on like how the routes are called and things like that, that's based on that. If you don't like that or if you need a subset of it, you can take it and you can disable parts of it. But the idea is really that you can install a GraphQL module on the Drupal site and everything can be requested. And I'm talking about everything. We're not only talking about config content entities, we're also talking about config entities. So everything that is within Drupal that is somehow accessible, we will, uh, we will be able to um, do through GraphQL. 
Another thing is also we have full Drupal cache and cache tag support. So everything that you load, even though you go very deeply, is using itself the Drupal caching in um, the cache interface with the cache tags. So if you, um, if you make graphical requests with the Drupal module, you see a huge amount of cache tags in there. You can use them and stuff like that. And we're also already supporting mutations. So you can create entities via GraphQL. So basically you can do whatever you want directly um, via GraphQL. So let's now move from the back end and the GraphQL in between, let's move to the front end. As I mentioned, we are using React, Apollo, and Redux. Um, so React is probably the thing that you already know, that's the front end library, again by Facebook, um, that has, um, is quite widely used right now. Um, plus there is Apollo. Apollo is a project of the GraphQL community and Apollo basically provides a very broad um, set of li or tools that you can use GraphQL in almost every language. So there is a graph there's a GraphQL for uh, React, there's a GraphQL just for regular JavaScript, there's a GraphQL for Python, for PHP, things like that. So how do I communicate with a GraphQL endpoint? There's a GraphQL server implementation as well if you want to write your own GraphQL and all these things. Go to the Apollo um, website, you will see there, and we are using the GraphQL client for React that React can actually talk to um, the Drupal. And then for the people that already have used React, Apollo uses Redux. Redux is a state container which allows you to have different states of your React app so you can jump back and forward and you know exactly what happened. It makes it much easier for debugging um, what exactly happens but also um, for performance um, things. So, if we go back to 2013, 2016, I said Amazi Labs was a big opponent of um, React or decoupled in general. And one of the big problems that we saw was SEO and accessibility. Why? Well, if you have a decoupled app and if you had one in the past, all that was sent to the browser was an HTML structure with 10 lines of code with maybe one JavaScript file in there that then loaded all the stuff. And now please show that to a crawler that cannot run JavaScript, or show that to a screen reader that cannot show JavaScript, uh, run JavaScript. So what happens is all these things cannot load it. So you had problems in SEO, you had huge problems with accessibility. Comes in isomorphic JavaScript. So the idea behind isomorphic is your browser requests the first page, and that request goes to a Node.js server. And that Node.js server has the code that you run in the browser also running locally. So the server pre-renders everything for you um, inside the Node.js. So it makes like API requests to the Drupal and stuff like that. And then it sends everything rendered, the whole HTML with all the CSS, like, like it would not be a JavaScript app, it sends it to the browser and the browser displays it. So that means um, a, a crawler or something that cannot run JavaScript can display it, no problem, there's no JavaScript. Then there is a tiny little piece of JavaScript in that response, in that HTML. And what happens, the browser will execute that JavaScript and the, and the JavaScript will slowly take over the whole site. So every link Gets, like, um, gets replaced by React links and things like that. So it morphs into a full React app. And after that, every additional requests go to the API directly. You're not talking to the Node server anymore. And the React app queries GraphQL directly and renders that. Sounds complicated. It's actually not, but let's look at it. So we go to our website that we just launched today. Um, it's www.gomio.ch. Uh, it's about food. Um, it's German, uh, sorry. Um, but uh, it will be translated to French um, soon. Um, but we also will have other languages. So um, if I visit the website um, the very first time, um, and actually let me disable JavaScript because that's the best. So I'm disabling JavaScript in my browser right now. And I'm refreshing the page. And you can see that the whole page is loaded. So everything is there that you would expect from a regular website. And I can also click these things and it will load me another URL 
still with JavaScript completely disabled. So what actually happens is on www.gomio.ch is the Node.js server running, and every request that goes in is pre-rendered and sent back to the browser. Now I enable JavaScript again, and what we can actually see if we go to the network tab and visit the site, the page is loaded already, and we do some additional GraphQL requests already to make sure that that is. But if we go, um, if I now, let's say, click on one of the articles and we look here in GraphQL, it only makes two GraphQL requests. The first one is actually a course check because um, we have different domains, so you don't have to worry about that. But the actual request happens in here. So we have a GraphQL request that tells the backend what we actually want. And in the front end, we have all the things, the whole object, everything given. React gets that and will um, render that. And if I click now around, if I go back to the start page, if I go back in there, you can see how fast it is. And the reason is GraphQL or the React is actually caching all the requests. So Redux um, comes into play and helps us caching all these things. So the site is super fast after you have it done once on your, um, on your site, and you can see there are not even any more GraphQL requests anymore. So if, I, if I'm on the site and go back to the start page, there's no single GraphQL request because the React app already has that cache and will use it. So the first request is completely non-HTML and non-JavaScript. JavaScript will render, will morph into a full React app, and after that, you have one. If your browser does not support JavaScript, it's never executed, and the whole behavior is still the same, so the site can be crawled, it's accessibility-wise, it can be read by screen readers and stuff like that. So that was for us the first step that we really said, okay, now it gets interesting. Now we feel we can do decoupled apps because the problems of SEO and accessibility are addressed. The next problem, though, that a lot of people said, and um, quite frankly correct, was performance. If you use a regular REST API to load stuff, you will have a lot of different requests to the backend. If we look at that site, we have a menu with a, with a flyout menu, we have a header, we have multiple um, um, articles, we have a footer down here, we have inject. So usually these things are all separate endpoints and you would request them one by one via REST. So we could end up in having 10, 10 to 15 different requests, which just takes very long. As we learned, though, with GraphQL, we can do multiple requests in a single one. So React, Apollo, and Redux together keep an internal cache of everything that already has been loaded. And because GraphQL can, do, can request multiple resources in one single request, together they will figure out what do I still need and what do I not need? So let's look at that. So we see here on the website, we have a footer here. And the footer um, is actually injected by Drupal. So the, the, the React has no idea what exactly is in that footer in there. And we have another site that, um, or another page that has a map. So the map allows you to like filter. Um, you can, oops, sorry. The map, um, you can filter for it, you can, you can scroll through it. One of the things we will see, if now my site loads, the map does not have a footer. So right now, I'm visiting the whole site without never loading the footer. Um, because there is none. Like that design decides there is no footer there. So if we now look at the inspector and see the network tab and we filter for GraphQL again, now I go to the start page. The start page has a footer. So what happens, and the start page obviously has also a lot of code about the start page itself. So React will realize that the footer is missing and will also load the footer. It will not, though, create a separate request for the footer. It will request two resources at once, once the start page and the footer together. So I click here, and you can see GraphQL loaded things, and now we see in here, we actually have within one GraphQL request, we have two replies. One of them is the start page. The other one is the footer here. So we see the footer primary menu. We see all the links in there. Um, where do they link? Things like that. All things given by Drupal. 
And now, let's say I'm visiting one of these articles, and now the footer is already loaded, so I click on that, and now I can see the GraphQL response for that one does not have the footer anymore in there, it's just some social feed stuff. So that gives me the opportunity to really only load the things that I really need. And if I need a lot of stuff, I can put all of them in one single request, send them over, Drupal can generate all that stuff and send it back, and you have only one single request that really happens. So that was for us, that really took the decision that we said, okay, we want to try it, or we want to go forward, we want to use it, because the major two things, SEO and accessibility plus performance, were fixed for us. Interestingly, after we started to implement and do some stuff, we realized, hey, we need to run Node.js now. Um, so you not only like put some JavaScript files on Drupal and let, JavaScript and let Drupal output that, you actually need a Node server running um, in your hosting environment. So how did we do that? Like that. So the top part, <laughs> the top part is Drupal. It's, as I said, there are multiple Drupal, there are multiple front ends, and there's one single Drupal site in there. The Drupal itself, and um, there is a GraphQL Drupal module in there. So that's one, and that's gonna be the same. At the bottom, these orange things, that's each of the sites. As I mentioned, they are completely separate. So they are completely separate React apps, that all talk by the same GraphQL API to the same Drupal. And of course, they share some libraries and we, we do some via NPM or Yarn, we, we share libraries that we've built, but at the end, they're all separate. So what happens is the browser at the front will make a single request to um, the node. And as we learned before, there, um, the node has to render that because the browser never visited the site. So the browser makes a request and ends up on our um, Docker hosting stack. So the Node.js is all hosted in Docker. And in there, there is a Node.js Express server with the React, everything running. So that's the isomorphic part. And what that thing will do, it will actually make a GraphQL request to the Drupal. So that's the pre-rendering part. And after that is pre-rendered, it's sent back to the browser. You can see in there we have multiple CDNs and all these requests, they're all cached. So um, if the actual the star page is cached, is also cached in a, in a CDN, so if somebody already visited that, you're not even landing here, you go directly to the CDN and it sends you the whole page back already cached and then the isomorphic happens. Um, we are also caching the GraphQL requests because the GraphQL requests are very similar. They have one URL and a lot of data in them, so we cache them as well. There's a CDN in there as well that caches it. And now the fun part comes, if the browser can execute JavaScript and does isomorphic things and isomorphs itself in a full React, um, it actually makes now GraphQL requests directly to the Drupal. The node part is completely ignored from that point on because it's not necessary anymore. It runs in your browser now. Um, but it goes still through the same CDN requests that the, that, the, uh, that the node itself also goes through. Now you might say, well, that's a lot of CDN. Yes, it is. Um, and the actually very interesting part is we have multiple cache layers in there. So we're using cache tags to invalidate. Um, so the Drupal here sends cache tags back through GraphQL requests and the node itself will take these cache tags, add some more to them, and send it back to the browser so the CDN that is in between will also cache them. And if now, like a node changes, Drupal actually connects to all these CDNs and tells them, hey, please remove that cache tag and remove that cache tag. And at the same time, all of the requests are fully invalidated and the next person that goes in will request it. The images itself, they're completely bypassed by node. Um, they're generated by Drupal, they're cached as well, no big deal there. Um, and if we now actually have multiple sites, so let's say that is our Gumio, and we will launch 11 others, um, we will just create, just the front end will be replicated, um, so the front end can look completely different, and then we actually do um, the same fun here as well. If you have more questions about that, and if you want to actually see, 
I could talk two hours about that. Come and see me later and I can show you how exactly it works. Um, but with that, we have a really fast website that is completely cached and allows us to run Node and Drupal in parallel um, without needing to worry like and clearing too much things and stuff like that. Okay, so now we only talked about GraphQL and we talked about React and Apollo and Redux and we talked about Drupal. Wouldn't it be cool to actually see everything running together? So everything you need, you will find on that GitHub URL. I will tweet it later on. Um, Fubi, he is the guy that actually wrote the blog post that the cake is a lie. Um, he is one of our lead developers and he um, and published that whole app. And if you actually want to look at that thingy, um, let's go there. So it is a full Drupal with GraphQL in there and it's also a full React um, Redux and Apollo app. So we see here there is a back end and a front end and inside the front end we actually have in package JSON you can see that we are loading React, React Apollo, we are loading Redux and all these things. Um, there is a readme that explains to you what to do. You clone it, you run composer install, you run uh, yarn install or if you still want to use npm that also works. And then the whole thing is actually hosted on the Maisy IO local development environment. So you start the Docker containers, you install the site, and you enable the GraphQL module. And that here is the GraphQL demo module that Brandon before talked about that does some of the things that are currently missing in the GraphQL. So if you want to see how that works, go in there. And then we run our front end. So let's do that. I've already done it. Um, so we are a bit faster here. So that is my um, decoupled backend running on the Maisy IA Docker environment. Um, and in here I created an article that is called Hello DrupalCon. We can see it's node one and in there I've written hello in there. And you can see that's a regular Drupal. There's nothing else. That's just um, the whole thing. And now if I um, open the front end, so the front end is running inside the Node.js Express server and that is listening to port 3000. I started that with um, just um, yarn start um, so that automatically boots everything and if I now go to that URL local 3000 node slash one so the react will actually see that the URL is a path that tells me which node should be loaded and if I go here I can see it tells me hello DrupalCon it gives me back hello and if we actually look at the code here, we can see there's no server-side rendering enabled right now. So it is completely, um, that's the 10 lines of code I talked before about. Um, so it just sends you back the React. The whole React is booted. The React actually um, then queries Drupal. We're using Apollo. Apollo has an awesome Chrome extension that you can see the actual queries. So I can click on there and I can see that um, it requests Drupal with a variable node slash one and here is the whole query string. So this already does some fragments and it's a bit extended things um, of GraphQL what is possible but you can see that um, all these requests and um, there is actually also a GraphQL inside of that thing so I can click here and I can see the request that happens to the GraphQL of Drupal and also the return. And that is just rendered inside React, um, regular React components, um, nothing special there. And if I now, let's say, add another um, content. Uh, hello, React with Drupal. Hello. And I publish that, I go back to my notes too, and I have that as well. And because it's fun, and because we usually like to have node overviews, there is also an overview here. If I refresh that here, I can see there's an article overview that renders me the article. I can click on it. If we want to look at that query here, we can see that it's an article overview query, and um, it, re it does also GraphQL. So you can take that thing, download it and start it and you can play around. You can learn React in it, you can learn Apollo in it, you can learn Drupal in it, you can learn um, GraphQL in it. It really should be here for anybody that is interested in using it to get a very fast start. Well, we already did that, okay. So overall, 
if we look back of what we have done in the last six months, it was a very high initial investment. And to be honest, there were also multiple doubts in while we were on it if it was the right decision. Because we had to build a GraphQL module, we had, to we had to learn everything about React, we had to do a lot of different things. But we are, as a company, we're committed to open source everything that we've done for that. So you will find things on Fubi's um, um, GitHub, you will find um, stuff on ours, we will write blog posts about it, we're gonna continue also to talk about. We really believe that is one possible future how in the future, Drupal can work with decoupled. We don't say that every Drupal site needs to be decoupled, but there are some cases where it makes a lot of sense. And right now, it's very complicated to do that because you have to learn a lot of things. That's why we have like these decoupled um, starting um, packages for you to start and play around with it. Um, the developers are obviously very happy because they can now um, use decoupled frontends. The client is very happy because he's not gonna pay a lot of money for just a lot of different Drupal sites. He, they, we just have to implement the front ends. And overall, I feel we're very excited about the future. So, that's it. <laughs> we have more than 15 minutes time for questions. So if you have some, please hit us. So, um, two questions. Number one is, why did you choose um, Apollo over um, Relay, for instance? And number two, is the, in the, will, will the future be such that you can take away that Node.js server and it, it's possible to just have, not have that and just, you know? Okay, so we actually initially implemented it with Relay. The first, um, the first five months of the six months, we used Relay. Um, and then just Apollo basically took the whole GraphQL part in Storm. Um, right now, it's just the best tool to use GraphQL almost everywhere, especially in React. And um, there were, it's just much bigger support like the, the, um, the Apollo dev tools and things like that. So that we just like that much more. Also Apollo actually, the, um, the multiple requests in once is something that you don't have to worry about. So you just make multiple endpoint requests inside of React, and Apollo will realize that you need multiple resources, smoosh them all together in one GraphQL and sends it out and comes back and will also take them apart again. So there's nothing that you have to worry about, especially if you need a lot of stuff. And in the Relay, it's just not that easy. So we actually took the time to refactor the whole thing into um, Apollo. The second question you had about the Node.js stuff. Do I still need a Node.js um, server? If you wanna have server-side rendering, yes. There is probably not gonna be another solution than actually running Node.js on there. If you don't have a Node.js server, you have two possibilities. Either you, ho you find a hosting company that does, or you can also just, all the JavaScript files, you can bundle them or you can build them in JavaScript and host them on the Drupal. Like they're, at the end, they're just JavaScript. The thing that we will lose then is all the isomorphic and the server-side rendering. So um, you have to think about SEO and, and accessibility again, but from a technical point of view, it's not necessary for any of the React stuff to run that. Actually, if you run it on local development, most of the server-side rendering is anyway disabled because you wanna have all the dev tools in your browser. Hi. Hi. Um, so about um, cache invalidation in the browser. So for example, what happens if your footer changes and you're still browsing the site as a user. Um, of course, you, you have to refresh the page, but yes. this is different from, you know, the... Yes, so per default, because it's cached, it means, yeah, if somebody changes the footer and you go to, to just click on the start page and it goes back, you're not there. Um, well, what we're basically gonna do is we're gonna... It's not really decided yet, but the idea is to have some kind of um, validation check so that when you load the page or it's already there, that um, GraphQL makes like a request back to the Drupal and asks like, did anything change? And if yes, it will only request what exactly has changed. Another way would also be to actually have a WebSocket open and Drupal pushes it directly in there. So like you could have the start page open and there's like breaking news. I'm not sure if a restaurant website has breaking news, but technically it's possible. Um, and then it's like it's automatically injected without you do anything. And that will definitely something we will implement. 
so for, for the first option, you would basically request the footer every time, only it, it wouldn't return every time. That's a possibility, yes. Um, or you just actually ask Drupal back what has changed and then request again. But right. yeah, there is a lot of different architectural ways how we could do that. Yes. I'm sorry if I missed this because I joined late, but uh, you were speaking about GraphQL and the ability to uh, get like requests for several things at the same time within the same request. So Correct. when you are streaming back the response, is it actually streamed? So when you are no. no, it's a regular GET request. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm asking for some personalized information that takes time to render, it basically will be sitting there until all objects are rendered and then sent back. It's not like with Big Pipe, you get streaming and you... Yes, correct. So improve. what will happen inside of Drupal, the caching, the, the Drupal internal caching will... Um, will not load everything, so an actual GraphQL request is quite fast, but it's correct. If you have, let's say, a request, or if you have a resource in there, which Drupal takes, let's say, three seconds to load, um, you could, um, it, the whole GraphQL request takes three seconds. But we already talked about, or we already looked at it, and technically it would be possible to say that, like, you just send back what you already have from Drupal, and tell um, and do things like Big Pipe to just have, have an actual stream and just send additional stuff. So there are already implementations out there where GraphQL could be used through something uh, like Big Pipe or so. So it's coming soon. I'm not sure about the soon, but it's coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just ask two. Um, I guess why did you pick Drupal as the back end? Uh, implementation for the site and what were the strengths and weaknesses of Drupal um, and if you could speak at a very high level like how you're going to implement the multilingual component uh, yes. for this application. So the, the decision for Drupal, a good question, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, so one of the big things that we needed as Drupal, Drupal has to play like a content distribution hub because that is a media company, and so they actually have their own um, tools for writing content and stuff like that. So Drupal, we have a lot of different migrations inside of Drupal to, uh, like for example, one of the sites we're gonna launch next um, is a Type 3 website. And so we have to migrate that constantly and incrementally over because while we're developing, um, they're editing the site. So, um, so we're using the migrate framework for Drupal very heavy and extensively. And so that was one of the things that we needed that no other CMS right now has that really strong migration stuff. We're also using um, Search API to index all the content. Um, currently in Solar, maybe future in Elasticsearch. That is also just in Drupal. You just click it together and it's there. Um, and then the Drupal, um, because we're running multiple sites, we are using the groups module to assign content to different groups. That's also already there. So um, it was just from a, a part that Drupal really brought, what it brought already to the table. Yes, there were thinkings about just using Symfony, for example, but um, at the end, Drupal made a lot of sense because like, yeah, things like migrate, search API, it's all already there. And the second question I forgot now. Ah. No? Multilingual. Ah, multilingual. Well, it's like you would expect it. Um, so in the, um, in the request to the GraphQL, there is just a path or a, a, a language pre um, prefix in there or a language code. And based on that, Drupal loads the multilingual stuff. And whenever you call an entity, Drupal does its thing with the entity API in multilingual and just returns back. And um, yeah, and you will see it actually in URL, in the header, things like that. So. Nothing special. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of this. It's uh, pretty fascinating. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the hosting component. Like everything was, I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. And then it's like, we've got CDNs everywhere. Like how much of that are established patterns that are you know, well documented that you can just like spin up a container with all those needs or hosting environments that sort of provide those things out of the box, and how much of that is stuff that you had to configure yourself, like on AWS or something like that? 
So we are just using the regular MAZ-IO stuff. So running like a Drupal in AWS and running Docker containers that are actually given by a Docker file. So each of the front ends have their own Docker file that defines what should be built. Um, when this is pushed into the Git repository, we have our webhook handlers that look at different sites and they will building, they are building the Docker images locally, they test them, and that is pushed then to an OpenShift. So the whole infrastructure runs on OpenShift on AWS, and the OpenShift will then deploy the Docker containers and stuff like that. So from a developer point of view, yeah, they only have to write the Git repositories and or the, the code, do some Docker files in there, push it, and then our platform as a service will take over all of that. Um, in terms of the CDM part, I've not really seen what we're doing right now anywhere else, except maybe with Facebook itself. Um, it's definitely very complex in terms of um, that you have, like in key CDN, what we're using right now, we're having like each website has like four to five different URLs because the API is different cache than the front end and stuff like that. Um, we have an extensive documentation that explains everybody how it works. We have graphs, but there is not like just a key turn solution that I could tell you like go there. But at the end, it's all get requests. We actually had a problem in the beginning that we had post requests for GraphQL because the problem is that at one point the requests get so big that they're too big for an HTTP head or like a parameter. So you have to send them by a post None of, the key C none of the CDNs out there can, can uh, cache post, except with, with Fastly, we were possible to do that. So now we move switch to get requests, so that's no problem anymore. But it's definitely an, um, yeah, a customized solution, I would say. But again, it's not necessary. Um, it's really because we know that we're gonna build a platform that runs 12 different websites with millions of requests per day, so we're, we're building or we're in investing in that right now. Hey, uh, great talk. It's, it's good that you're sharing this. Um, I work at uh, Major League Soccer, and we, uh, we use Drupal, React, and GraphQL. All yes. Day. Not all together, though, right? Okay. The, the Node and the, uh, the Drupal part are separated. So my question to you is, like, we're investigating uh, you know, a possible decoupled approach. So can you talk a little bit about how the templating, layout, and overall um, editorial experience is affected by the decoupled approach? Um, the, where, where, where are those responsibilities held in your application? I'm guessing it's on the uh, React Node.js end. So you're asking about how does an editor edit content? Sure, or like do layout on a home page or move uh, you know, blocks around and things like that. So currently, it's just a plain Drupal old school admin backend. Oh, okay. um, there is no editorial GraphQL React system yet. The reason for it is that most of the content is actually not written on the Drupal site oh. because it comes from an editorial workflow tool and it's just pushed or migrated via Drupal. Mm -hmm. um, so the actual part on the Drupal site is only that there are editors in there that build these landing pages. So they take a lot of different stuff and pull them together and we're using paragraphs for it. So um, a lot of the things are actually paragraphs that you just like reference existing nodes or you reference paragraphs, so we have nested paragraphs that you can create these layouts. Um, from a usability point of view, I would not say that we're very proud of how it works right now. Um, it's just something that we said, it's the front end first, and we might actually also implement the GraphQL or a React backend, um, but right now it's just plain Drupal. Cool, thanks. No problem. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm working on a project with similar architecture, and um, I'm wondering how do you exactly proxy requests from browser to Drupal? How do we proxy? Yeah, I, I saw in the architecture diagram you you bypass Node.js. Yes, we use different URLs or different um, domains. So um, if we go here. The www.gomio is the node, so everything that goes there, the CDN forwards that to the node site, and all the GraphQL requests, and uh, let's create one. Well, <laughs> it's cached. So the GraphQL actually goes to api.gomio.ch, 
and that's another key CN in front of it, but the upstream for that CDN is then the Drupal. So that's how we bypass um, the Drupal. We thought about having um, like a system that the CDN has like some routes and looks like at the paths and then has different upstreams. It's unfortunately not possible in, a, in some of the CDN solutions, so we just said, okay, let's just use different API, API endpoints. And at the end, we're very happy that we did that because now I can, I can develop locally and I can just point my local React to api.gumio.ch and I will get um, the same response on the production side, but I can test local stuff. So, um, yeah, so we basically just have for all the different environments, we have different API domain endpoints. Thank you. Thank you so much on this. Uh, so thank you for sharing all the, uh, the code. A uh, couple of questions. Um, to provision all these responses, the JSON, did you have to write lots of um, backend Drupal mo custom modules or you were just using the, um, the <coughs> JSON API module or something like that? We're using the GraphQL module. To provision all the, um, um, the JSON? What is provision JSON? To send the, uh, the responses, the JSON responses? Yes, that's the GraphQL module that does okay. it. Yes. And the other question, there are a bunch of um, JavaScript modules, JavaScript uh, libraries to provision, you know, like um, this kind of architecture. So yes. what made you choose React versus Angular versus um, this other one? We're using React with um, Apollo and Redux. Yeah, but what, ver this one versus, for example. Can you speak a bit louder? I can hear you. Um, like React versus Angular versus, um, um, you know, Amber, those different libraries. Yes. So when would you make a decision to choose one over the other? Ah. Sorry. Um, and the decision came just from the people that were involved in the project already had experience in React. And we knew that because we decided to use GraphQL for the Drupal part, and at the time when we started, the implementation of React was the best with GraphQL together. So that decision came like from there to say, okay, we wanna use, um, we wanna use something that is very good working with GraphQL, and that's ended up being React. And overall, we just liked the approach of the component-based um, library of React. So that's the decision that we took there. Hello. Hello, this is super cool. I'm wondering, this might not have to do only with uh, React or Redux, but these sites, uh, do they have stuff like commons or people that can log in? How do you handle all that? Yes, so um, we have two things right now that are a bit, I would say, complicated. Um, so one of them is a comment functionality. There's actually a whole forum for the next site we're launching, and that's completely done by GraphQL and, and all implemented in, um, in React in the front end. So unfortunately, all the Drupal stuff that you're getting based on comments and all that thing, we're throwing that completely away. Um, we cannot use it. That's one of the part of the high investments that we're talking about, that like everything that you usually have in the Drupal, when you get into like dynamic stuff, you have to re-implement in, um, in React. But we're using GraphQL mutations to create the comment, um, to display it, and all that stuff. And um, the other thing we're also doing is, um, we wanna do web forms. So we wanna have web forms on Drupal 8 on the backend that an editor can create their own web forms. And that's why we need to expose config entities to the React. So the React will have the GraphQL endpoint to the config entities of a web form, look at the fields, and based on the fields load, they are mapped to React components, and then we'll do that. And then the, the, the submit handler of the form, then it actually goes back to GraphQL to the mutation to create a new web form submission. So um, that's the whole idea right now. Um, we're working on it and it already looks like it, but yeah, there is quite some things you have to do on the front end. Um, but again, we are really interested in, in saying, okay, like we maybe have a React component for Drupal web forms that we open source and then everybody can use it. Thanks. Hello, thank you. Um, I've seen several GraphQL libraries implementing complexity analysis on the queries so they can, so no one can take your site down with a very complex GraphQL query that loads, I don't know, 100,000 nodes at the yes. same time. Is the GraphQL module for Drupal doing that as well? <laughs> so if you actually look at the query that GraphQL does here, 
it's only a couple of only a couple of chars. So what we do, there is a special thing in here that is called versions, and there is another one that says ID, and there is a path. So one of the problems, yes, is that if you have the GraphQL API completely exposed to anybody and you don't like validate it, yes, you can take down a site with one single GraphQL request because you're just like, you're loading, like, let's say, like, if you go back to the Lou Skywalker, like, if you load the directors of a movie of the directors of a movie of the directors of a movie, you will have a memory overflow at one point. So what we're actually doing is, and that's also done by Facebook, so we took their idea. During the build process of the front end, there are scripts in there that look at all possible GraphQL requests that your React app can do, and they hash them. So instead, and that hash table is sent to Drupal via an, a, an endpoint. So now, and is saved inside of Drupal. So now, if the GraphQL or the React needs to do a request, it actually does not tell Drupal which exactly query you want. It just tells him, give me the hash XYZ, because we already talked about that before. So that's what the version is here and the ID. And then Drupal looks at that, sees which of the GraphQL requests does that actually refer to, and loads the whole thing in its own cache, and then runs through the whole stuff. Cool, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so that gives you two advantages. First of all, you can use GET requests again, because it's just a couple of lines of code. Plus, it makes your GraphQL secure because all you can do is exactly the, the request that you um, predefined before, and the API itself is not fully open. Um, that's a bit crazy, and I would like to have something easier, but right now that's the only way, and we also see the other ones doing it, and it works. So, like, it's all fully automated. So. Okay, so we have like, I think we can do you left, and then we have to run out. Right here. On. Uh, well, yeah, it, one, one, wonderful talk, thank you. And um, I, I guess I was just wanted to clarify, are y'all working on the GraphQL module? Are y'all working on uh, Fubi's yes. repository? Yes. And, that, and that's where we should look in the future as, as the module develops in May and 3.x matures. Yes, so the development happens on here, on Fubi, um, GraphQL something. Or is it GraphQL Drupal? That's the module that is currently happening. That's mirror to Drupal.org. And the decoupled app, if you want to work on that and send us pull requests, please do so as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm getting kicked out, sorry. Hopefully a quick one. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Amanda. Nice one. Sorry. Is that algorithm written in PHP? The, the one that crawls and No, uh, it's, it's JavaScript. Okay. I think it's bubble, yeah. but I'm not sure. But it's... Um, good question. <laughs> Not here, not here. But if you go down to the Amit's Labs booth, you will find a card there. Do you mind if I mention your talk in the API first kind of overview that we're doing at the end? It's a core conversation. Yes, I, and I also want to go. Uh, yeah. I want to be there. So just like to do it here. But yeah, is this your dongle? No, it's the. All right. What is your session about? Uh, it's about JSON API. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's about solving the same problem in a different way. Oh, that's cool. See ya. <laughs>